good morning. It's good to see y'all. I just yelled, I'm sorry. But it is a beautiful day with beautiful colors and sunshine. It's a good day to be thankful for God's grace. If you can do so without pain, can you please stand with us and we will sing together. Worship the God of creation. The first song we're going to be singing is Revelation Song, which uh, starts with, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is he.
This song is Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. This is my very favorite chorus. Uh, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me.
Father God, I thank you for loving us. Father, I thank you for all these people that are here. I thank you for the beautiful weather, for the change of seasons. Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember all that you've done for us. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you sit down, look around you. There are people... There are people that want to tell you good morning. You should tell them good morning. If you see me get up here, don't feel like you have to rush your good mornings. I just don't want you waiting on me. I've said it way too many times, and I'll probably keep saying it. That's one of my favorite parts of church together in the morning is watching people greet each other and actually seeing that y'all really like each other. Because that can be... I don't know, that's, it's amazing to be in a group of people that actually seems to enjoy seeing one another. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. That's from John 1.16. Uh, I'm going to actually read a little bit more around that verse, but... What does that mean, grace upon grace, other than being a really neat thing to tell people? How are you doing? Oh, I'm just receiving grace upon grace. Good. you got to love those little Christianese phrases that we come up with. They can be good, though, because they remind us that we should be looking to God and we should be speaking truth to one another. So I don't think that's a bad thing. In fact, I think it's a good thing. But a lot of times we mutter things we don't understand. A lot of times we just say, good. <laughs> we need to stop doing that. I know some of you are in a hurry. So I'm like, how are you doing today? I'm good. Okay. Me too. In fairness, though, I mean, I am I'm doing well. Not everyone wants to hear it, I know, but I'm doing really well. My back hurts and my knees hurt. That degenerative disc in my neck is screaming. 
I did actual physical labor yesterday. Not as much as some of you. I'm not used to it. My body reminds me I'm not used to it. But I'm going to go ahead and read from John 15. Or John 1, sorry. Wow. John 1, verse, I'm starting at verse 15. There was my number confusion. And I'm just going to read through 18, which is the section I pulled our welcome verse out of. John testified concerning him, and we're speaking of John the Baptist, saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me surpasses me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have already received grace and place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Um, this was interesting to me because it appears to me that they're referring to the law given through Moses as God's grace in this section. Have you ever thought about the laws of God as being his grace? The definition of grace is unmerited favor. Well, that's a rough definition, but unmerited favor. Favor of God that you didn't deserve. I don't know that I've ever really thought of the Ten Commandments as being the grace of God. Have any of you ever thought, well, God cared for us so much that he gave us these statutes to live by because he wanted better for us, because he wanted to be in relationship with us. That was actually grace. Have any of you ever thought of that? Because I know I surely hadn't really thought of it that way before. Okay. Um, every now and again, I look out and I expect to see some sort of reaction. There was none. <laughs> Whatsoever. Like, don't look at me. Don't look at me. I don't. Um, so when I'm thinking now, when I read that term in another translation, because that was the exact same verse, or that exact same verse was in there, but in the, I believe the ESV, it just says we've received grace upon grace. So now when I hear grace upon grace, I'm going to be thinking about that grace that God initially showed his people when he gave them these rules to be in relationship with him. And then on top of that, the fulfillment of that law, which was Jesus Christ, right? God considered us, and he gave us this opportunity to be in relationship with him, and then he fulfilled those very laws in Jesus Christ. That is what grace upon grace is. And if you think that's the only part of this sermon, I'm sorry, because that was, what, five minutes, 33 seconds with my rambling, so there's more. <laughs> But um, that's just one of those things. Uh, I've been trying to plan out my sermons in advance. My brain doesn't always work like that, but I'm trying to be more organized. And so I was just like, grace upon grace, that is something that we should talk about. So I was just thinking about what is this grace? What is this grace? What does it look like? And then how do we respond to that grace? Well, how do I respond to that grace? And I am uh, going to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And I'm not going to read all of 2 Timothy chapter 1, but pretty close. The books of Timothy and Titus, which I'm sure you know, but if you don't, the books of Timothy and, and Titus are actually where I'm going to be going today. And those are pastoral letters. That's what they call them. They're epistles, but they're epistles to leaders in a church. They're letters. That's what epistle means. They're letters to a leader in a church. And all he's really giving is, in the sections I'm going to read, are instructions on how to be teaching people. Now, even though he's writing to the pastors of the church, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't apply it to every one of us in this priesthood of all believers, in this group of Christians that we are. 
I think we could all own these verses. We could all take them personally. So I'm starting in chapter 1, verse 6. And again, I'm in 2 Timothy, because if you're in 1 Timothy, this is not going to match up. (laughs) For this reason, I remind you to fan into flames the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. That's a painful word, isn't it? Self-discipline. Oh. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel. By the power of God, he has saved us and called us into holy life, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel I was anointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. So just in that little section of verses, Paul is speaking of this grace that was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. If you go back to John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through all Him, all things were made. Through Him, all things were made, and there was nothing with, that was made without Him. I am jumbling versions, forgive me. This is the downside of reading several versions of the Bible, is when you start to quote Scripture, you're drifting back and forth between NIV and New King James and King James and Amplified or whatever else, but in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. John tells us that Jesus was in the beginning. And it's weird to think about this, the way that Paul is explaining it to Timothy or the way Paul is telling it to Timothy. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. This gives us a little insight to the idea that God is eternal and God is sovereign and God knows things. And I keep harping on this, I know, but you should never feel like God is shocked by what we do. Before the beginning of time, God knew what was going to happen. And before the beginning of time, this grace given us by Christ Jesus was already It was already there. It was already going to happen. Paul refers to himself as a herald and an apostle and a teacher. A herald is someone who speaks for someone else. Do you consider yourself to be a herald? I had a friend named Harold. But do you consider yourself to be a herald, someone who speaks for Jesus, for God? Because whether or not you consider yourself to be a herald, if you are a Christian, you kind of already agreed. You are someone who is speaking for God about this wonderful grace, this unmerited favor, this favor that God gave you because God loved you that much. And I don't want to make this sound works righteousness e. That's the thing about grace is you didn't earn it. You can earn it. You're not going to earn the grace of God. I'm sorry. But we have this privilege and opportunity and uh, 
responsibility to tell other people about the grace of God and to live as though we actually believe in God because that's a very dangerous thing, really. And I, I'm using the term dangerous. You probably won't die from it. But it could ruin life as you know it. What if we lived as though we believed in Jesus? Like actually believed in Jesus? And the saving grace of Jesus. What if we actually lived as though we believed it? Because when you believe something, your life should show it. And I'm not saying yours doesn't. I'm sure your coworkers and your friends and your family all know you're a Christian. But what if we lived every moment, even when no one's watching, as though we truly believed in the grace of God, if we truly believed in Jesus? Would we look differently? I don't want to ruin the surprise if you've never contemplated this, but we would look differently. All of us would look differently if every moment of the day we were like, you know what, I believe in Jesus. How am I going to respond in this situation? Well, I believe in Jesus. There's implications to almost every situation that you're going to be in. How should I respond? I believe in Jesus. What am I going to do today? Well, I believe in Jesus, so... And I don't think that belief in Jesus is going to keep you from going to a baseball game either. It probably will keep you from cussing out the ump, though. We're in the book of Titus now, because I I warned you I was going to go there. Titus chapter 2. And again, now this is a letter from Paul to Titus, different guy in a pastoral position. Now, I don't know if this is a bunny or just something I feel like I should explain. I think we think of pastors differently than they did in the first century church. I don't, I can't prove that. I just think that we we tend to. Pastors are people that would teach So in that way, we're the same. But I don't know that anyone ever set out to be a pastor in the first century church. I think they were, they had hands laid on them and they were kind of anointed into the position. But I also know they didn't have church buildings with church treasuries. They probably didn't have bulletins and assistants and... All of that. I need to be careful with this because I don't want to talk myself out of a job. But I think that their pastors were actually very much part of their congregation. Very much part of the group that was meeting. They were just the person that God was using to teach. They were the person God was using to oversee. So, when you're reading these pastoral letters, it's to the pastor, but the pastor is very much part of the group. Or at least that's how I understand it. Doing good for the sake of the gospel is the section uh, title for chapter 2. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. That is a word that makes us nervous sometimes. Doctrine. Theology. Woo. Right? It scares some people because it sounds heavy. I think those are words we should celebrate, not really be afraid of. Theology is simply the study of God. You are theologians. You're welcome. You all have doctrine, whether you know it or not. 
If I asked you what your beliefs were on any given subject, you should all have an answer. You have doctrine. It doesn't have to be a dirty secret. We can discuss it. Sound doctrine is biblically-based beliefs. Biblically-based beliefs on life and godliness. It's very popular now to have very culturally shaped beliefs on life and godliness. It is destined to fail. Culture changes so rapidly. It's destined to fail. It's really important for us to have a, a, a solid foundation on what we believe. Everything else, it becomes like building a house of cards. The sturdier your salvation is, the sturdier your belief is, your, your base is, the better chance you have. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. When we think of the typical American elderly gentleman, love may not be one of the words that you think of in the way they behave. Some of my favorite elderly men have been grumpy old men. And they played the part so well. But they didn't always radiate that loving, well, love. They didn't really radiate love. In all other ways, there's, there's men in my family, like my great-grandfather really didn't tell his kids he loved them. It was assumed. Some of you probably had parents that didn't throw around, around that L word very much. And it isn't because they didn't love you. There was just something has happened to men where certain things are not masculine and you just don't do them. And there's part of that that's wonderful, don't get me wrong. There's other parts that are incredibly damaging. Like not saying that you love someone you love. Not being allowed to cry when it's warranted. Crying over soccer games, I'm never going to get used to that. I don't even want to. Little children throwing fits in the grocery store over their mom not buying them the right cereal. I'll never get used to that either. I've experienced it, for certain. I've probably even done it. It's been a few years. Just a few. But I love when it describes how older men should behave, because I'm going to be one of those. I'm in training to be an older man right now. It's taking a lot of hard work, but I'm in training to be an older man. And when I'm an older man, I'm to be temperate. I'm to be worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith in love. So even though I've gotten really great at yelling, get off my lawn, that's not what I'm supposed to be aspiring to. Likewise, teach older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, or to te uh, excuse me, but to teach what is good. They should urge younger women to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. You notice what it says for older women, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine. I don't, this must be a timeless idea, but I've noticed on more than one occasion gatherings for women that typically involve wine and are a gossip fest. You don't even have to involve the wine. If you see a bunch of people sitting around gossiping, one of the things that I've heard that called is a sewing circle. <laughs> Anybody else ever heard someone refer to it? Look at that sewing circle over there when people are just sitting there gossiping. 
That phrase comes from somewhere. But we're supposed to, well, older women are supposed to be examples of not that behavior and teaching the younger women that it's okay not to be a part of that. We have this weird phenomenon in culture right now that I think they call the mommy wine culture, where a lot of mothers are part of this wine of the month club. And if you watch any amount of television at all, you'll notice most mothers have a giant glass of wine or wishing they did. Somebody's really good at marketing is all I can figure. And I'm not, live to your convictions. I'm not denouncing all people that like wine with their dinner. That's not what I'm saying. Live to your convictions. Be temperate. Be sober-minded and vigilant. But if we're promoting an, a, a culture where it's good to constantly be drinking, uh, or if we're just okay with that, that seems inconsistent with me. Be self-controlled and pure. Be busy at home. Be kind. This is the one that rubs people the wrong way. Be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. What does that mean to be subject to their husbands? Be subject to their husbands. Hmm. Some people, when they read that, what they hear is be like chattel slavery, be enslaved to your husband. That's not what it says. Be subject to your husbands. So, in reality, it's calling you to be subject to someone who is called to love you as Christ loves the church. If we believed in Jesus and we acted as though we believed in Jesus, a woman subjecting herself to her husband would not be scary because he would be under the authority of Jesus. He would understand that he has this incredibly high calling to care for and to lay down his life daily for his family. There's no danger and putting yourself under the authority of someone that will lay down their life for you. Unfortunately, in this fallen and very selfish world, that's quite askew. And maybe that's something that husbands and wives should be discussing together. Is what does that look like to your wife? As a husband, what does it look like to your wife for him to love you as Christ loves the church? What, what kind of idea does that give you? Now, be careful, guys. But then, perhaps you should discuss with your wife what you think it looks like for her to be subjective, un to be under your authority. And like I said, be careful, gentlemen, because that could be some dangerous territory. Think about it first. Discuss it with yourself first, because whereas I think it's a really important conversation, it's really an important conversation to have thought out. You don't just want to spout off anything that comes to mind. Similarly, similarly la, 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 la. there's more L's in that word than I was prepared for, I'm sorry. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Self-control. I know as a young man, I did not have any. Self-control is difficult. It takes a lot of discipline. So us, not as young gentlemen, perhaps if we showed a better example of what self-control looks like, 
it would be easier for the young men to see what self-control looks like. And if we encourage them to exercise self-control, you know what isn't a very helpful way to exercise self-control or to teach self-control to young men? is to tell glorifying stories about when you punched somebody in the face when you were their age. Because I've noticed fathers like to tell those stories. Or when I was your age, almost everything that comes after that phrase has the potential to be damaging. I know most of my when I was your age stories usually involved, oh, I'd have gotten spanked for that. I'd have gotten hit for that. I, you know. How many of you have those stories that you tell your kids? Thank you. Appreciate your honesty. I have a slew of those when I was your age things. When I was in high school, we wouldn't have put up with that. Jeepers. Maybe that's not the best way to show self-control. I think the way that we paint a picture when we tell a story can either be very glorifying or it can actually just serve as what happened. There's lessons to be taught from our mistakes, too, and I don't think we should always hide our mistakes from one another. I think that's part of our problem as Christians is trying to hide our mistakes. But the way that we approach things and I I heard someone use this term once and I love it because it so well summarizes much of my experience at youth events was the game of top that testimony where it becomes this glorification of the sins instead of the saving grace of Jesus be like well Jesus saved me but before that I did this and then the next kid has to one-up him or else it's going to be a boring testimony and then someone else yeah, yeah, it so it's like, I used to be mean, I used to do drugs, I used to sell drugs, I killed a man. It just escalates to ridiculous portions, proportions, excuse me. I think the way that we talk about what Jesus has saved us from is important because we can glorify the sin instead of the Savior Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make teaching about God our Savior attractive. If you replace the word slave with em- or employee, Biblical slavery is slightly different than American slavery. I think both are bad. American slavery was chattel slavery. They were property for life. Their kids were going to be property for life. Biblical slavery was more for time periods, bonded servanthood. Sometimes they were war criminals. Slaves used to be allowed to own property in some ancient cultures. They would even get paid. So... When I read slaves in this, my head goes to employee at a terrible job, which all of you have been at one point or probably will be at some point. An employee at a horrible job. Who are my uh, fast food alumni? Show of hands. I worked at Arby's for five years. God delivered me. Anybody else work fast food in here? Just me, really? Wow, only church in America. Almost everyone has worked at McDonald's or Arby's or Pizza Hut or KFC or something. Country Foods, I worked there too. (laughs) Country Foods, GC Murphy's, Mighty Fine Donuts. Yeah, that's a good product that I'll stand behind right there. But a lot of us have worked jobs that we found less than easy to do, less than flattering, soul-crushing, minimum wage, awful. Has anyone in here not worked a job that you could describe that way? 
Some of you are scared to raise your hands because you've worked for some people in this room. <laughs> but if I was going to take the example that, or the, the advice that Paul gives to Titus when talking to slaves, which is perhaps an extreme example of that, be subject to your boss in everything. Try to please them. Don't talk back. That was my biggest issue. Don't talk back. And not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. Think about it. That might be one of the most effective ways to minister to somebody is while you are working a thankless and horrible job. It may be the most godly you will actually appear to people. Be like, wow, look at them. Something's going on with them that I just don't understand. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. I'm going to read that again because it's so important. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. I'm going to stop. Again, I know it talks so much. Who does Jesus love most? Love you, Dawson. Really, who does Jesus love the most? Is it Americans? Is it Mennonites? Is it... Is it the British because they have those fun accents? Is it Puerto Ricans? Is it the Jews? Who does Jesus love most? Is it Sicilians? Clearly it's the Dutch, right? Mennonite church. But that's not what scripture teaches us. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. So this grace upon grace has been offered to all people. That first dose of grace was offered to some people, God's people, the Jewish people. This grace on top of that grace, that fulfillment of that law has been offered to all people. And as one of my favorite authors says, and I find it very convicting, you will never look into the eyes of someone that Jesus wasn't willing to die for. Can you see the most wretched among us as being someone that Jesus died for? Because I think once we get there, we will understand this grace upon grace. When it, you actually hurt for how ignorant someone is, when you hurt for how awful someone values themselves. I'm not the only person I'm sure because it's a, what do they call them, an epidemic? Some of us have loved ones and friends that will inject pure poison into their veins because they have such a low value of themselves. But God incarnate, God himself was willing to die for that individual. Are we willing to talk to that individual? Food for thought. Do we believe in Jesus? Do we actually believe in Jesus? Excuse me. Oh. All right, for grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches, new Bible, sorry, us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, to redeem us from all the wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Are we eager to do what is good? 
or are we just afraid of doing what is bad? These, then, are the things that you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority, and do not let anyone despise you. That was a lot, I know. But really what I wanted to address this morning is grace upon grace. What does the unmerited favor of God look like? And what does that mean for us? And then the most convicting question I know is do you actually believe in Jesus? Because if you actually believe in Jesus, you probably won't have to tell me. I'll be able to see it. And I'm not exempt from that just because you let me stand up here. That is for every Christian. Is do we actually believe in Jesus? Because if we believe in Jesus, that means we have to actually live it. There's no way to believe in something and then not live it. That's a recipe for disaster. I believe in gravity. That's why Austin and Isaac were going up the ladders yesterday. I think I went up once. That was a lot. Scary up there. But do I have that same conviction about my beliefs in Jesus? I'm terrified of falling. I try to stay off the roof. I believe in Jesus. Do I believe in Jesus as much as I believe in gravity? Do you believe in Jesus as much as you believe in gravity? Because it's way more important. And that's all I have for you. Um, (laughs) If you can do so without pain, would you please stand with me?